Welcome to the Shower Epiphanies podcast, where we explore your hidden thoughts and desires, revealing your greatest drop the mic moments. Now, here's your host, Art Costello. Welcome to the Shower Epiphanies podcast. Today, Duff Gardner is my guest from British Columbia. I've known Duff, I guess, probably a little over a year. I met him at the New Media Summit in Austin, and uh, he's just an incredible human being. I love him. He uh, has so much to offer, and today we're going to hear his journey and story, and with that being said, Duff, take us away. Hey, Art. I'm super honored to be on your show. I've been looking forward to it today. It's a beautiful sunny day here in Victoria, a bit cool by your standards. It's in the mid-40s, but not a cloud in the sky, and that's the way I feel about your podcast, so thanks for having me on the show. I'm honored to have you, always. Thank you. So you'd been asking me a little bit about, I guess, my story and kind of what is going on in my world. Is that something that I could talk to your audience about? Is that all right? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Okay. Well, yeah, we were talking offline. And I think that for me, like I was a really shy kid, very shy. And the way I think about that now as an adult, I was reasonable. I've kind of recently decided I need to be more unreasonable in my life. But, you know, what happened to me, I think, in my 20s, it was during the dot-com time, and I was noticing all of my friends. I was married, and we were just, Maureen and I were just starting a family. We'd moved up to a little town in British Columbia called Nelson, BC, which is a real cultural hub in the middle of the mountains. Everybody was, it was, it was a beautiful place to start raising a family. And I was feeling kind of away from all the excitement that was happening in the big cities. This was in the 90s. And I had this idea that I wanted to get involved in dot coms. So I stepped out of my comfort zone and I started, I created a startup. And wouldn't you know what I did that kind of at the back end of dot com, it was during <laughs> dot bomb. So I actually, my most successful startup actually happened during dot bomb. And that's where we had our success. So it was a great learning experience where I had to step into being completely out of my comfort zone, creating the startup. So it kind of went from an idea I was called CareWave, and you know it changed over a couple of years. But by the time we hit our peak, we were the very first alliance partner for BlackBerry, which was a the big mobile company of the day, and we were touring around with them as their, one of their first alliance partners. Just a small little company out of Vancouver. We had three stories in a cool area, Post and Beam office in Vancouver. We were winning financing forums. We were doing all these fun things. It was a great experience, but. For someone who's like me, very shy, very kind of reasonable, it was completely stepping out of my comfort zone. In the middle of that, like a lot of companies like this, it came apart. And I was actually really good at navigating that misstep. And I had a bunch of missteps after that. But what happened around the same time is that, in fact, my marriage to Maureen ended at that point, And we forged what I'm incredibly proud of today, which is a co-parenting relationship, which has endured over 20 years. So I was really good. I became really good at navigating, you know, the missteps that happen in life or the things that happen in life, the obstacles, what have you. And I decided I would take a job. I decided to be reasonable. I decided to listen to everyone around me to be reasonable and to take a more safe job. And it was a cool job. It was heading up the New Media Association in BC. It was I was a VP. I was running a big multi-million dollar innovation project before the Vancouver Winter Olympics, meeting a lot of great people. And what happened was that I was working in an environment where one of the key the chairman, I guess you could call him, would consistently make these comments about uh, gay folks in the cultural industry. And what he didn't know and what people in my workplace didn't know is that what had happened in, to me is that uh, Maureen and I had had a conversation about, you know, not just separating our marriage, but me coming out and being a gay man and and what have you. And so although in my personal life, everything was going great, we had told our children, everybody was their friends, family, everybody was on board. You know, a few years later, after that happened, I was suddenly in an environment where it wasn't safe to be myself. And I didn't even understand it deeply at the time that that was something that could be impactful to me. But years, years later, as people start talking more about diversity and inclusion, I started to realize that this had impacted me quite a lot, because what happened is that I ended up having a series of panic attacks. And panic attacks are weird things. They just kind of, they happen out of the blue. It's not that you're scared or nervous. It's just like, it's literally like having a heart attack. You don't really know where it comes from. It comes from a deep, I guess, a deep emotional place. And I probably still need to learn more about that stuff. But in business, what that did is it created a bit of a roller coaster. So you're 
up and down for a decade, just trying to learn how to deal with that thing. So I think what I've learned more recently is this idea that I call standing in your value. And it's something that I try to live. And it's something that I try to extend to my clients is just understanding what you're all about. And that shy little kid that I used to be, what I try to do is I try to access the unreasonableness in me. And I try to bring that into everything that I do going forward here. So I don't know, it's, I have kind of a different story. It's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of a, I don't know what part to pull out of it that's the most interesting. Well, I think that what's interesting is that through a whole series of events, you've been able to navigate. And I'd like to hear how, how you navigated through a business failure, I guess you could call it, or a business de- demise, sure. you know, through a, a personal yeah. marriage demise, and then the journey of coming out. And you talk about being right. shy, but you've overcome all of those because there are people out there who fold over any one of those, no less three of those events in their life. And that is something to really be proud of, Duff. I mean, and that is one of the reasons why I am so proud of you, because you have an inner strength that most people don't have. And it really is, it's a beautiful thing. I mean, it's something that most men will not admit to, will not acknowledge, and you've done it. And I'd like to hear what your thoughts are on how how you did it. I mean, I don't want need you to get you know too deep into it, but I mean, I I know that you know how you overcame things. Right. Thanks for asking. I think that it's interesting because, like, in a very short point of like period of time, I had to navigate, as you say, transitioning from a marriage to a co-parenting mm-hmm. relationship in the context, and I also had to navigate. My first startup, again, as someone who was shy, who stepped into, I was incredibly proud of that. I mean, I remember winning the financing forum in Toronto, standing in front of 300 venture capitalists. And soon after that, the company was kind of not there. But I navigated that really well as as well. So I think like what I was proud of is that I seem to have built this ability to navigate some of those challenges in life. And if you contrast that with just being in that one place where I was trying to be reasonable, trying to be, I, by the way, I also, in, <laughs> I invested in, what was the company called? It was a company in Toronto. That, <laughs> anyway, long story, but I was being reasonable then too. It didn't work. But when I was in that position where, you know, for example, they're in the cultural industries, of course, there's a lot of gay folks. So, you know, the disparaging kind of backhanded comments for some reason, like that kind of an event created panic attacks. So if you contrast like, marriage ending, coming out, losing your startup, and just being able to navigate it against something that feels kind of innocuous, like, you know, not feeling safe in your workplace because people are talking disparagingly about gay folks and getting panic attacks from that. It's really an interesting contrast. And so I think what it does is it shines a light for me on what subtle biases that exist in society can do to people. You You can be incredibly adept at navigating missteps and failures in life. And yet something which seems like a mouse to others creates panic attacks Mm -hmm. in you out of the blue. It's just very interesting to me to kind of juxtapose those two against each other. And I think that's why like later in life here, the opportunity to stand up and talk more about the importance of a diversity and inclusion means a lot to me. You know, I'm 54 years old. And I guess at that point, you know, you start to think about what's important to you. But I think you you asked me kind of about my story of coming out and how that all worked. And I would say that that's probably the thing in life I'm the most proud of. I've had some success in business, but I'm the most proud of that. You know, it's kind of a long time ago now, but we were in early 30s. We met when we were 18. You know, I am 54. I grew up in Alberta, which is like Texas. There was not a lot of information or I didn't really understand how or why I was different. I didn't even really feel that different. And we had met when we were 18. And so we had five years of dating and 10 years of marriage. And then we hit that point where a lot of people do early 30s, you know, you put each other through school, bought houses together, hit a bunch of big milestones in life, your partner's in crime, and then you have a family and you start to change incredibly. And I think that's where a lot of couples hit that drift. And at that point, you have to make a choice. Are you going to come back together or do you need to diverge? And in my case, there were a few other things going on, but we sat down and the the thing that I'm most proud of is that we forged a strong co-parenting relationship. She's remarried. 
I'm uncle to some of her second set of kids. My kids are 23, 25 now. They've known about this since they were two and four, and they're the most independent, respectful, conscious people that I know, and I'm incredibly proud of them. So that's my biggest victory in life, and that's part of their journey now. And I guess they get to get out and take that out to the world too, their experiences. The need to have closure in any given situation is sheer human nature. And when it comes to romantic relationships, this desire skyrockets. Has your previously failed relationship left you in immense pain? It's not uncommon for people to shy away from a new relationship after their first one fails miserably. The fear of the unknown makes them hide in a shell to prevent any future heartbreak. Relatable? Despite wanting to love and be loved, you can't take the plunge if your mind and heart are still locked somewhere in the past. Maybe you aren't aware of the power of releasing the past, or perhaps you don't know how to do it. Art Costello in his online course teaches the art of moving on from bad places to happier, more stable ones. This course can change your life for good, helping you beat all kinds of negativity on the road to eternal bliss. Sign up now before the gloominess gets the better of you at expectationacademy.com. Yeah, one of the things that I want to address that I heard you say, you know, is that people need to be careful because words hurt. And when they don't choose their words carefully and they don't put thought into it about people around them, they can do tremendous damage to people. And when it comes down to it, you know, there's very little difference in all of us. Where the difference lies is in how we perceive our world around us. And when you have a bigger, broader view of the world and realize that there is all kinds of different people. It's not only about being gay. I mean, it's about having different political ideas. It's about having different raising cultural ideas, raising children ideas. I mean, you could, there's as many diverse ideas around. You've got to be open to other people's ideas and other people's lives without being judgmental and making rude comments about it. When you do that, You're really limiting your ability to learn about other people because you don't open your eyes, you don't open your brain, your mindfulness is closed, and you really don't see the beauty in that person when you're making these disparaging comments or judgments about other people. And I just wish we would learn not to do it. You know, I don't know that we ever will. But it would be certainly be a great step forward in the world if we would stop judging other people and just accept for who they are and how they are. You know, a lot of people enter marriage and they want to change their partner. It's the worst way to enter a marriage because you cannot change anybody. Only they can change themselves. And you just got to be open minded enough to include and not judge. Any thoughts? Yeah, actually a big one. And I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it because what I'm not talking about is not bullying. Like that's Mm -hmm. definitely a thing, but there's these subtle cues that we convey to others, whether it's racial cues, societal cues, cultural cues. In my case, yes, there was a disparaging comments about gay folks in the culture industry, but there was also subtle cues So when they kind of mix together, the person, the receiving end of that message just becomes, it's like walking on eggshells. You're not quite sure who you're supposed to be. So in in my case, in that particular position, my job shifted once there was awareness of me being a gay person. And what it occurred to me as was a form of constructive dismissal. Over time, my position less and less responsibility was was given my way it, to the point where I had to leave that position. So the subtleness of the way that we talk about things is sometimes as impactful as the obvious. So an example would be I sat down with a good friend of mine and she said to me in full support, you know, like there's three words that I would actually, if I had my druthers, they would be the things that I would eradicate from people's vocabulary. <laughs> and so they are lifestyle, tolerance, and agenda. So there is no gay agenda other than 
like when I go to bed at night, I read way too much hockey news. <laughs> like I know everything about the NHL. Yeah, my other agenda is to look after my dog. Other than that, I really don't have one. Lifestyle, you know, when we hear that word, it's like in this particular case with this friend, she was like, well, you know, like, I don't think people should judge your lifestyle. <laughs> I was like, I think you're right. And I don't think I should judge your lifestyle either, knitting <laughs> grandmother. <laughs> you know, so my lifestyle is like anyone else. I just, I live my life. Isn't that the way it's supposed to be? Absolutely. You know, just because who I love has no bearing on what I do during the day. Um, whatever people's perception is that I do, it's, I, can, I can assure you it's very boring. And the other thing is this idea of tolerance, which thankfully is a word that's kind of starting to seep away, which is like, you know, we need to be more tolerant, which implies the person you're talking about is less than you. So those are three words that kind of bug me. I want to tell you a story which kind of got me interested in this topic. And that is that I was sitting watching Frances McDermott accept the Academy. And, and most people remember that moment where she stood up and accepted the award at the Academy Awards. And it was at the height, not the height, but the kind of the height of the beginning of the Me Too movement. And it struck me as interesting that here was a forum where a woman was standing up, you know, breaking the rules in terms of what was normal or reasonable for someone to accept an award and talking about female empowerment, you know, because of the venue and because it's Hollywood, probably a good 30% of that audience, at least, was, you know, in the LB. Uh, I always get the letters mixed up, but you know what I mean. <laughs> and yet the leaders in the gay community were off holding the most cool parties in Hollywood. So there's, there's this weird thing as a gay person, you know, you kind of tend to want to just live your life and go, well, I've dealt with it. From the outside looking in, there's some incredibly successful people who are gay. And what people don't see is the dysfunction that all the negative stuff towards gay people creates. There's addiction, there's death, there's suicide. There's people being thrown off buildings around the world simply because of who they love. And so, you know, as a gay person, you tend to think about, you know, just live your life and let people see you as you are. And yet at the same time in that moment, it just struck me that wouldn't it be cool if there was a gay person doing the exact same thing? in front of so many people. And so um, I think that's when my interest in being more of a stand for this uh, really hit me. Yeah, you know, I have a lot of thoughts going on in my, my head right now. And for sure, you know, being a straight person, it's hard for me to identify with how you think. But yet I do identify with how you think, because I think very similar to you in the ways that you know, was it Rodney King that said, you know, why can't we all get together? You know, why can't we just, you know, not judge, not do all these things that we've been talking about. But yet when I put myself in your shoes and think about what it must have been like for you to feel those little jabs coming from people you work with and then having the feeling of losing a position, be having it lowered in a very clandestine kind of way or a very secretive, I don't even want to say secret. I don't know what it is. To me, it's disgusting. I was just going to say it. But the thing is, the person who was doing that, I don't think they had an understanding that that's what they were doing. Really? Like, I think that we, you know, we in life, I don't think so, because it's kind of, see, that's the thing that I want to rally against is that, you know, sometimes there's these subtle things that we say or do, and we don't even know that we're doing them. Sometimes we categorize somebody as one way, and then we discover something about them and recategorize them in our head as a different way. And although the one person who was saying the disparaging remarks, that was one thing, the other boss that I had that had the power to shift my job, in her case, I think it was more of an unconscious thing where she just recategorized me from being a peer into someone that she needed to manage. And, you know, it, it came from actually being an advocate of gay people because she just had this point of view that we were all out to have fun. And that's not me. You know, it just wasn't me. So, you know, these biases that happen to us, whether it's about gay people or, or racial bias or any of these different kinds of bias can be really powerful without us even really understanding what we're doing. And so that's why it's important to shine a light on it. Well, to me, that comes back to making judgments on people without facts, without sure. having, I mean, you did nothing to back her ideas up. That was her bias. And people who have biases like that, 
those are the people that really need to work on their personal development, their own personal development, expanding their ideas and their knowledge about people. Because your performance is what should be the key at work. It should not be right. how you identify it genderly or, you know, those things. I mean, it, I guess it's hard for me because I always take people for what they present to me. And I try not to judge. I mean, I really, really am conscious. And I think I've done a pretty good job over the years of getting myself to where I don't try to change people or judge people or, or anything. I like you for who you are. You're a very kind person. You and I have had great conversations. And that's who you are to me, Duff. I mean, you're not anything but that to me. And I accept you because you are those wonderful, great, kind person. I know your heart. Right. I know how it is. And, you know, that's a great, Thanks, sir. that's a great, beautiful thing. So I don't know if, if I'm being unrealistic. And I've always been the oddball. You know, I've always thought differently than other people. Has anyone ever inspired you to discover a happier, healthier, and more fulfilled you? It is a magical experience, isn't it? Inspiration is indeed very powerful, yet it's often undermined. It can lift you from the ground to the sky in no time. Have you ever thought about returning the favor by inspiring the people around you? If you don't think you have it in you, we have good news for you. Art Costello's online course has everything you need to learn to supercharge yourself and shape your character into a powerful personality. Get ready to discover your strengths and unleash the creativity within. Don't believe it? Check it out yourself by signing up for this life-changing course at expectationacademy.com. That's expectationacademy.com. Well, you know, I think that it's just, that's kind of my mission, you know, it's just, I think for me, like where it's taken me as far as wanting to make an impact is like, I really would love to eradicate those ideas of lifestyle tolerance and agenda, like in the context mm -hmm. that we just talked about, but a bigger picture is like, I, I would love to export the brand of diversity that we have in Canada to the world, you know, being a Canadian and being able to be married for over a decade now. I think that would be really important to me. And so I, I think that's a story that's still being written for me. Uh, one thing that I definitely believe is on the spectrum of LGBTQ, we speak both masculine and feminine. And I think there's more of that required where people speak both languages. I literally think we can be the bridge to peace in the world. So my message to people who are listening is to think about people in your community who are who are gay as being that bridge to peace. You know, we can speak the masculine and the feminine. We can be the bridge between the two polarizing ideas that are currently ripping our world apart right now in many ways, you know, and I, I think that we can play that role. So there's this concept in the Aboriginal community called two-spirited. And I believe in that is that we can embody both spirits and bring that to the world. So that's going to be part of my message going forward. That's, I mean, that's beautiful. I know that you want to talk about the modern family. <laughs> and sure. what does that encompass for you? Well, I think we all live in a modern family today, don't we? You know, like I think that nuclear family idea is admirable and it's, I think it's the minority, but that doesn't really matter. I think that the thing is we all do our best in life. You know, things happen, circumstances happen, things change for us. So for me, of all the things I'm most proud of, I've had success in business. I've had success in a lot of different areas of my life. I've also had lots of failures in my life. But my proudest success are my two kids, 23 and 25. And they're amazing, independent, capable, creative forces in the world. And so, you know, my story is part of theirs now. And they're my biggest supporters, as is their mother. So, yeah, that's my proudest achievement in life. You know, I just had this thought. Maybe I should call it an epiphany. <laughs> I just had this thought. <laughs> yeah. You're on the shower. <laughs> I just had this thought. <laughs> That, right. you know, when we label stuff, when we label people, when we label things, it does come with a prejudgment. Every time you label something, there's a prejudgment mm -hmm. attached to it. And sometimes it's negative, sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's neutral, but it still comes with some type of judgment. So 
maybe I'm having a spiritual awakening with labels and stuff right now. Right. It's true. I've always been against labels because I believe that, you know, I mean, we've done tons of research with calling people stupid and you know, children in school in, in early ages, calling them stupid. And they begin to believe it after a while. If a teacher continually tells a child that they're stupid, you know, they live up mm -hmm. to the labels that are put on them. So if we label somebody gay, does that mean that our view of them is going to be in this certain way? Is that what you're saying? And that, you know, do we need to get, I mean, I know we need to get rid of it because labeling, I think, mm -hmm. Is terrible because it does come with prejudgments. Am I, ram am I rambling or is it making sense? <laughs> no, no, it makes sense. So, you know, like, okay, so a lot of people have seen the show Will and Grace, mm -hmm. right? So the character Sean Hayes plays, the friend, you know, if a lot of people might think that that is a stereotype of who a gay person is, which is, yeah, it's a person. It's not all people. And so if you have that sort of label, that you associate with people in your realm who are gay, you might treat them a certain way, right? Like there's sort of an unconscious label that gets associated with someone like him. I would think of him as kind of like fun and goofy and flamboyant, silly, flamboyant. So if you're in a C-suite, which I was, and seen as a peer, and then suddenly you're aware that this person is gay and you attach that kind of an idea to them. That's what I'm talking about when you start to sort of prejudge people based on what you perceive they should be in your head. And that's where you got to check yourself. It's like, you know, I, I'm hesitant, but I, I'll throw it out there. Like in Vancouver, there's a thing that some people say about some of the new drivers to Canada, that they're terrible drivers. And to be honest, some of them admit it themselves. So that is a bias that people hold about people who come to Vancouver and start to drive. And so, you know, like, is it cute? Maybe. But if you, if you take that idea and you push it forward into relationships and, and what have you, you can see how it starts to become like a furball in relationships with those people. Um, and it could potentially color your relationship with them. So that's exactly why labeling is bad. Yeah, that's what it does. Because, you know, when I see Sean on, you know, Will and Grace and all that. I know his personality is just, I can imagine that he, he's pretty funny in real life. You know, he's very funny. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we all have different personalities, whether we're gay, yeah. straight or in between. We all have our own personalities and they come out in many different forms. Yours was shyness. Mine is talkativeness. I love to talk to people and I'll, break, and I'll break out a conversation anywhere, any place with anyone, you know. It's my form of learning about people and making my knowledge base more diverse. Because the more people that you interact with, you learn that there are so many similarities to us. There's more similarities than there is, what's the word I'm looking for? Differences. Different, well, yeah, different. differences. Yeah. which direction you want your life to take? Are you sinking deep down into the pit of uncertainties day by day? So what's the secret to leading a happy, satisfied life? It's taking matters into your own hands. But what if the matters in question are a total blur? Art Costello's Expectation Academy course aims to tell you exactly how you can get some clarity in your life. This course can be your savior on your journey to reinventing yourself. While you certainly can't plan your whole future ahead, you can definitely control twists and turns your life takes. So what are you waiting for? Sign up for this course now at expectationacademy.com. Get a chance to broaden your horizons and add meaning to your life. That's expectationacademy.com. You know, I, I think that, you know, you bring up this idea of being shy again. And, and so for me, like I was very sporty growing up. I was a high performing athlete. I got drafted into junior hockey at a high level or my soccer team was playing in the North American championships. Like I was really athletic. That's what I was in love with when I was young. <laughs> I was young with the pursuit of athleticism and performance and playing games. You know, that's kind of what was interesting to me back then. But I was shy socially, you know, like really I was kind of a wallflower. I can still tend, I can still go in the direction of wallflowering myself. Absolutely. So I fight that 
every day. It has nothing to do with being gay. It's just just me. I'm just, I contend towards being a bit of a wallflower. You know, another story, one of the things I've loved is I've played in the sports leagues in Vancouver. There's, we call it beer league hockey. It's adult it's recreational hockey in Canada. We call it beer league because you have a beer afterwards with everybody. And so there's a club in Vancouver. There's three teams. It's a, it's a gay club. We play against straight teams. There's probably a good, maybe there's a hundred different teams in the league. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a great way to just stand for who you are. And everybody's aware of the fact. And interestingly, in over 10 years of playing in that league in Vancouver, it's called the Cutting Edges Club. I think there's one or two times where someone on the other team, usually a ringer who wasn't a regular, you know, dropped the, the fag word or something like that in the heat of the game. And, you know, what was interesting is in both those cases, the teams we were playing instantly kicked that player, not just out of the game, but out of their team. Like they just didn't have any tolerance for that. So, you know, like I would say just to put a capper in that conversation for me, like I, I love being a Canadian. I love what Canada stands for in terms of diversity and inclusion that way. And I would love it to, as I formulate kind of how I want to express this, export that idea to the world. And, you know, maybe there's a through line in that that I bring into business that I'm even unaware of. But yeah, I would love that to be a, a result for me going forward. Let's talk about business a little bit. You own six companies now. Is that what I heard you say at some point? I did not say that, but that sounds amazing. <laughs> I wonder where I learned that. <laughs> I don't know. But let's go seven. <laughs> as long as they're profitable, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, right. Exactly. No, I've, I've got kind of a diverse portfolio, but I do a little angel investing. I, I do consulting work and I've, I've decided I wanted to create a coaching brand. And the reason I did that is just because maybe it's my age. I just enjoy working with people. I learned a lot being in the startup world. I learned a lot of, there's a rigor to building a startup. And so when I see a lot of people who are service-based entrepreneurs, especially the ones that are trying to make an impact in the world, I see that, that the rigor that I experienced in the startup world can really apply to them to help build a more expansive, sustainable, consistent business. So I try to bring that, what I call startup thinking into the coaching and transformation world with the work that I do so that people can make the impact that they want to make. That's really cool. I mean, it's a different, it's a different approach to a startup. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I really learned that. We just released something called the impact scorecard. So the impact scorecard, I believe it's the first performance scorecard for the coaching and transformation world. I'm not really aware of any other ones out there, but what it's designed to do is take the stuff that I learned in the startup world and my grad degrees in learning sciences and IT. So it's, it's that too. I always geek out on anything to do with cognition, learning, how that impacts our performance, that kind of thing. Even just my experience in the games world, all those kinds of ideas are infused in this performance score called, called the card, called the impact scorecard. And what it's designed to do is give some leading indicators of the five key performance areas where people are you know, either applying themselves or not. So it's a quick and dirty little three minute, it's kind of like an assessment where you can go through it and then you can take a look at that and it gives you a bit of a sense of where you're at. If we end up having a conversation, it helps me to kind of understand where you're at with your business. So that's the way it's currently manifested in bringing this idea of startup thinking to impact driven entrepreneurs. Wow. That's another really cool little thing that you've developed there. So how do you come up with these? You know, like, I, I don't, it's not like I just kind of whipped it out. One day. It's like, let's do this. You know what? It just occurred to me. I was doing a bunch of launch management work. I had decided when my kids were about to leave high school and go into university that I wanted to start thinking about doing different things. You know, when you do consulting work, I live on an island. I live in Victoria. It's about 450 metropolitan area, 450,000, but we're on an island. So it's complicated to get out and about. And so the idea of consulting, flying around and you know finding clients all over the place, it was getting to be exhausting and I wanted to enjoy things a little bit more. So I wanted to get more into coaching and I started doing what I call launch management work. So helping people do online product launches. And I started to see how people were having challenges with their businesses. Well, what I learned through that process is that what I knew, which is that everything kind of begins with a solid offer. Like you have to understand how to put a good offer in place. In other words, if I can't communicate to you what it is that I'm doing and why you should care and why you should buy it, 
and what it is that you're buying, like that's where you should start. So in other words, people who are trying to grow, say you're a service-based entrepreneur and you know, well, I need to figure out some way to get my business online. I need a better online presence, something like that. What tends to happen is that people either go out and spend two years building something or thinking about building something like an online course or a book or a mastermind or something like that, or they dive headfirst into marketing tactics, five-day challenges, online product launches, video series, YouTube marketing, content marketing, but they're not making any money. And so the way I think about it is this, is that your offer is like, if, if you don't focus on the offer first, it's like going and building a house on quicksand. It might look really good for a little bit, but then the forms, the cracks start to form and then it just gets sucked into the quicksand. And that's literally what people are doing when they are going from, you know, I'm 54 again. So like, especially people who are say 40 plus, like you, you might have some internet digital savvy to you, but when you're out on your own and you're isolated in your own little office and you're trying to grow your service-based business and move it online a little bit, it's a very different thing. And all of us get caught in that trap I'm just describing consistently. So that's where this idea of startup thinking and focusing in on a solid offer can really help people. Yeah, that's that's really, really powerful information right there that people can really use and apply mm-hmm. because I know there's a lot of truth in it from my, from my experience and trying to market. Mm-hmm. I'm going to shift gears a little bit. And I know For that sure. you're into adopting animals. Dogs. And yes. I wanted to yes. talk a little bit about that because we both have a love for animals and dogs. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing there. Oh, for sure. Well, so I have a rescue pity. So he's part of the Pitbull family. His name is Seamus. And he is an American Staffordshire Bull Terrier. He's eight and a half now. And he's a lamb. He's an absolute lamb. There is not a pillow or a blanket that he doesn't like to cuddle up with. <laughs> and about eight years ago, I co-founded a company, a local company here in Victoria, and Seamus became the mascot for that company. I don't actually have much involvement in that company anymore, except that I march in, I think it's eight, no, it's nine, because this is going to be a new one, nine parades each year locally. The company's called Men in Kilt, so I wear a kilt. Seamus has a branded bandana as well, and sometimes he rides in a sidecar in those parades as well. So he's become a local celebrity and literally the television station is like, oh, there's Seamus again. They recognize him every year. So, you know, pit bulls, first of all, are lovely dogs. And when they're brought up in an environment where they're safe and they're cared for and they know they're loved, it's amazing the love you get back from those dogs. And secondly, in terms of, you know, in Canada, we have a different environment for pets and rescue dogs and all that than than exists in the States. It's kind of complicated why that is, but the pets that are up here tend to be adopted. Whereas in the States, there's these high kill shelters where dogs have like not a lot of time to get adopted. And the unfortunate truth is that disproportionate amount of pit bulls, pit bull type dogs are being euthanized every single day because of a stereotype you know, going back to what we talked about with LGBTQ, like it's the same thing. They're being stereotyped as vicious animals when in fact they are just incredibly gentle, kind animals that make the best, best, best pets. So anyway, he's, he's just an amazing dog and I love him to death. And if he can be a stand for rescue pets, that would be a wonderful result as well. Yeah. Austin just went to no kill shelters. We're no kill now. So that's good. I'm glad about that too. But you know what strikes me through the whole conversation about Seamus and and everything that we've talked about today? Mm -hmm. Isn't it amazing that when we raise things in love, they give love back? And when we raise things in hate and violence, it begets it back too. And it just says a whole lot about the power of really being loving and caring and kind and and gentle, it makes a big difference in this world. Yeah. Dogs are energetic creatures. They pick up on energy and they just, they channel it, you know? So when they bark, it's actually just a release of energy. So yeah, I agree. Like what scares me today is the the energy being released in the world is a scary thing, but 
you're right. Like with pets like Seamus, they can be incredibly, they're energetic creatures. And when they're treated right, especially like talked about being self-employed in that, like they're amazing. He's amazing. He uh, is my um, vice president in charge of culture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the company. That, that's a good position for him. <laughs> Vice President, he doesn't make me a good coffee, but he's pretty good at coming and giving my leg a lick when I need it. <laughs> that is, that's. He hasn't quite mastered the espresso yet, but yeah. we're working on well, it. Well, they're smart dogs. I'll tell you what, if there's anyone you could teach, you'd be shameless. So, you know. Yeah, we've got, both got good Celtic names yeah. too. So they're all fans. Yeah. Anyway, we're nearing towards the end of our conversation, and I wanted to give you okay. time to uh, give us any last thoughts and then where we can get a hold of you and how we can get a hold of you. And I think the most important thing is last thoughts, you know, what you want to leave all the listeners with. Right. Thanks, Art. You've actually got me thinking really deeply about some of my journey in that. And I use the word wallflower today, which is not something I've typically use, but it's totally my truth. I have an expression in my podcast, which is kind of new called off my duff, uh, which is the idea of how to get off your backside and get your, make, get your impact started. <laughs> so you, of course um, I, you're on my show coming up, which is exciting. And I'm, I'm happy about that. In, in that podcast, my parting comments are to teach what you love and to live from your truth. And I think that that's what I would say as a closing comment, that I think it's it's incumbent upon all of us to teach what we love and live from our truth. And that is how we bring peace to the world. Powerful words. I think that you couldn't have said it any better. I mean, it's a fundamental truth that we need to live by. And uh, where can we get a hold of you? You can get a hold of me. If that scorecard interests you, if you do happen to be an entrepreneur and are kind of trying to sort out ways that you can move your business forward a little bit more quickly and more authentically. And you can go to theimpactscorecard.com. It's called theimpactscorecard.com. Again, it's like a three-minute exercise. And you can also just go to my website, which is duffgardener.com. So D-U-F-F, if you watch The Simpsons, like the beer, Duff Beer, D-U-F-F and Gardner, G-A-R-D-N-E-R.com. And they can get some information there as well. Duff, as always, it's a pleasure having you on the show. You're an incredible human being, and I can't wait to have you back on and we'll do some more things here. And I hope that we've struck a chord with my audience about how to live their life authentically and honestly, that their words matter, that what they say matters. I think there's a whole lot of great, diverse lessons today in this conversation. I really appreciate you being on. You're always a friend and, and you're always welcome here in Austin anytime that you want to come. Art, thank you so much. I'm so honored to have you as a new friend and I loved having a conversation yeah. with you today. With that being said, folks, you know where you can get a hold of me, expectationtherapy.com. And I hope that you take to heart what we've talked about today. Reach out to Duff, get his scorecard if you're an entrepreneur looking to start something. Everything will be in the show notes where to get a hold of Duff. And Heather White, you can go ahead and take us out of here. Thanks for listening to the show. Drop us your comments and questions with what you want answered on the show. You can subscribe on iTunes and Binge Network. You can also get more information on the website, expectationtherapy.com.